Once upon a time, dollar was as good as gold. The United States and most other countries minted gold coins. Paper money was a promise to pay in gold. But today, the dollar and most other world currencies are supported not by gold, but by credit. Paper backed by paper. The experience of Germany in the early 1920s is the classic horror story told by those who urge a return to the gold standard as the best way to stop inflation and stabilize economies. As prices rose, the government printed more and more currency, and prices soared again. Eventually, the German mark literally was not worth the paper it was printed on. Bundles of paper money were needed to buy a loaf of bread, and a postage stamp cost millions. So what is the situation for scarcity? Why do we even need cryptocurrency? So let's look at the uh, everyday money that we use. I have the US dollar, uh, the Chinese yuan, the euro, and the Swiss franc. And what I'm showing here is uh, official government statistics as to the amount of money in circulation. This is M1, which is uh, paper money, currency, and also checking accounts and savings accounts. So it's cash and things that act like cash, all together. And each of these plots is showing uh, since October 2008, which is when the Bitcoin white paper came out, that is the left-hand scale of each of these four plots. So this is 2008, and then uh, this is the uh, end of 2019. You can see that the money supply has inflated for everybody. So in, in just 11 years, the money supply of the US dollar has gone up 2.6 times. So in other words, the, the printing presses of money have been going on at that, at that rate. We don't really notice it because every year the prices that we see go up a little bit, but it's like the, the frog in, a, in boiling water, right? So the frog doesn't understand that it's sitting in boiling water until it's too late and it's cooked. That's the kind of um, situation that we find ourselves in. Now, the, the thing is that all of the global fiat currencies are kind of uh, turning on the printing presses at a disturbing rate. But what counts as victory? What counts as being uh, sound and prudent with your uh, particular country's currency? Well, it's inflating slightly less fast than the other guys, right? So we still have this situation where if you zoom out, if you zoom out, for example, for the US dollar, you go to like a 50 year time scale, you see basically an exponential growth curve. So this is a problem that all uh, savers face. If anyone who has assets to save is up against this current that's coming up against them in that they're constantly being diluted by new money that's uh, being created. All right, 2008 is when the Nakamoto white paper came out. So this is the Bitcoin white paper. Um, and the key uh, insight to this, I won't go too much into the um, geeky details, although uh, I'm assuming that everyone here has an IQ of at least 140. So it wouldn't take you long if you haven't already to, to like look at this paper and study it. But I would say that um, the Nobel Prize in economics cannot be given to a anonymous person. But were Satoshi Nakamoto a real person, this, this clearly would be a, a Nobel Prize winning insight in economics, being where, in which economics is just this, the study of scarcity, really. So what Nakamoto consensus does is it, it synthesizes a, me a method to create digital scarcity without needing a central authority to maintain that scarcity. So in all of our um, national monies, in the, the uh, European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve in, in America, these are all centrally governed bodies that decide what to do with the money supply. Now the theory, the macroeconomic theory, is that the money supply will expand and contract to match the actual uh, economic output of the society. So in other words, if a society is really productive and it makes a lot of stuff, then the society is justified in inflating the money supply because they've been productive. Um, but the problem is that uh, countries get into trouble. They get into debt. 
They promise uh, services to people uh, that are too expensive and then they can't pay for them, they go into debt. Uh, so the problem is that mismanagement causes this uh, kind of fragile balance between the size of the money supply and the size of the underlying economy to get out of whack. So why is it uh, interesting to have a source of scarcity that doesn't require a central committee to be making decisions like uh, uh, for that uh, money is that it offers uh, a way for people to opt out of the fiat monetary system. It, it also provides a kind of a fire under the feet of the fiat central banks to be maybe do a little bit of a better job. Um, you know, maybe we um, might have a, you know fewer financial crises in the future. Maybe we won't have another. Uh, 2009 style financial crisis. Um, all right. So the way that the Nakamoto consensus does this, there are three ways. So at the account level, uh, in other words, how, how is it that one person's Bitcoin is not uh, confused with another person's Bitcoin? It's that when a person signs up for a Bitcoin account, so to speak, what they're really doing is picking a number they're just picking a number out of a 256-bit uh, uh, field. So this is, um, people are really bad at imagining huge numbers, but we're talking about picking a number between zero and 10 to the 77th, right? So one with 77 zeros after that. So to understand how big that is, uh, imagine the, the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy. Now imagine electrons being lined up right next to each other, and I'm using just the classical electron radius uh, here, all right? So for the entire diameter of the Milky Way, we have electrons lined up, right? That turns out to not be enough. You have to take one of these electrons and blow that up to the size of the Milky Way galaxy, and then get another set of electrons going across, right? Then even that's not enough. You have to take one of those electrons, blow it up to the size of this hall, and then you have bacteria lined up one after each other. That's 10 to the 77th. That's how, how vast the space is of the random number that you're choosing. And that is why uh, getting a Bitcoin account doesn't require going to fill out some form and asking permission for an account. You just pick a number, right? You just pick a number, that's your private key, and you need to um, kind of defend that because knowledge of that private key is what is needed to spend uh, a person's Bitcoin. Aggregate level of scarcity, that is, how do we know how much of the Bitcoin there is in the entire monetary system, and how do we know that that's not, a get, not gonna get corrupted? Well, the scarcity is uh, enforced by an open network of miners, which are really gossipy accountants, um, and they are rewarded for be behaving consistently with the consensus rule set. Finally, how do we know that the, uh, the record of who sent what to who which is what the blockchain records. So the blockchain is a, a series of blocks. Each block contains transactions from this person sent money to this person, who, who sent what to who and how much. And the, each block is just a, a, a record of that. How do we know that that's not gonna get corrupted over time? Because as we all know, there's, there's bit rot, right? There can, there can be a corruption, there could be some uh, um, uh, like, um, malfeasance going on with the state of the database. So the database is maintained because each block has a small data field in it that the miner can change. That's called the nonce. And each miner randomly changes the nonce so that the hash of the block is lower than a number called the difficulty. Usually when we talk about hash uh, functions, we don't care about the actual value of the hash function. We just care that the hash matches some other hash. Like if you're checking a uh, filed integrity, then you would take the hash of the file that you downloaded, and compare that with the hash of the file that you're looking for, and you compare those. In this case, we're actually caring about the number of the hash, like how small, how large is that number. And the difficulty is a number that must be um, satisfied by each block. So in other words, the hash of each block needs to be lower than the difficulty. And that's how, so to make a real world analogy of this, imagine that you have an accounting book that has each, uh, 
each page of the accounting book has 10 minutes worth of transactions on it. And you want to make a way to make sure that each page is really rare in some way. So one way you could do this is you could say, the mass of every page of this accounting book has to be an even multiple of one million atoms, right? And so, so each uh, accountant is going to be kind of touching the paper, rubbing it, erasing little bits, because at that level, you're taking away or adding trillions and trillions of atoms. So it's going to be a random number whether your um, answer is, a, whether your page is a, actually an exact multiple of a million atoms, right? So once that's found, that's a very rare page. It's a rare page because it has a, uh, exact uh, multiple of one million atoms to it and because it's a now it's a digital representation you can copy that exactly right so now you have a, a chain of blocks each one of these has this rare attribute and the blockchain links them all together all right so scarcity in Bitcoin and Monero they both have an original code base. So there are many, many projects in cryptocurrency in which Bitcoin was simply forked and modified a little bit. That's not the case in Monero. It was written from scratch. Uh, the elliptic curves used are different. So this is a form of technical hedging. In Bitcoin, the SEC P256K1 elliptic curve is used, whereas in Monero, it's ED25519. Both Bitcoin and Monero, as I mentioned before, require a private key, like spending the cryptocurrency requires that you know a, a number and that's the private key that's true in both bitcoin and monero where we start to differ is that monero also has what's called a view key the view key is another private key which is actually a kind of a subset of the of the uh, spend key the view key is what is needed to decrypt the transactions on the blockchain that you personally are involved with so if you have the view key, you can see what transactions you were involved in on the blockchain. Everything else remains encrypted. The address space is, is different. So in Bitcoin, it's 10 to the 60. Uh, in Monero, it's 10 to the 76. So there are more addresses available in Monero, uh, which means if you're worried about the birthday problem, the birthday problem is the problem in which uh, if you have a group of 30 people, chances are much higher than you would expect that two people out of those 30 have the same birthday. So if you extend this now to the uh, problem of picking a random number and calling it your own for a, uh, for a cryptocurrency account, you have the same problem. Like there's no guarantee that the random number that you pick for your cryptocurrency account is not going to subsequently be picked by me, right? That's the birthday problem. And so the birthday problem is less of a concern the more addresses there are. So the emission deceleration is another uh, difference between Bitcoin and Monero. In Bitcoin, it's stepwise. You might have heard of this thing called the halvening. This is uh, every four years in Bitcoin, the number of Bitcoins that gets rewarded to miners as a reward for finding a page in the blockchain gets cut in half, which means that on every miner's calendar, there's a date circled in red that um, their income is going to get cut in half. And so that introduces a bunch of kind of needless drama, really, in, in the um, mining. In Monero, we avoid this by having a continuously decreasing uh, emission. Now, another difference is in what is the emission rate of coins in the far future? So in Bitcoin, the block reward eventually goes to zero. And they anticipate using uh, transaction fees to uh, make up the difference. In Monero, there, we have a concern that we want to always be assured that miners will have uh, incentive to keep working for the system. And so in Monero, we have what's called the tail emission, which works out to be 0 0.6 Monero per block that goes on in perpetuity. But that money, basically, that future money gets used to pay uh, miners to continue to provide security for the network. So what's the far future inflation rate then? In Bitcoin, they can say it's exactly zero. In, in Bitcoin, they're fond of saying there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin created. And that's an easy thing for people to understand. Uh, but yet in Monero, we have constant linear inflation. Uh, but it's not really correct to say that this is infinite supply as, is, as gets uh, bandied about. Because if you look at the inflation rate, 
in Monero, it's asymptotically going to zero. If you look at any macroeconomic theory, uh, what the relevant variable is, is the inflation rate. Nobody really cares like, that the nominal amount of US dollars is going up by whatever trillions of dollars per year. It's the percentage that matters. And in Monero, that percentage is already low, and it'll continue getting lower. Some curves to show what I'm talking about. So these are supply emission curves showing how many coins of each type uh, exist as a function of time. Uh, you can see that uh, Monero had a later start here, uh, and it has a tail emission. This tail emission is this constant linear slope. So the reason for this slope, again, is that the new coins that get, that get emitted are being rewarded to miners who help secure the network. Whereas in Bitcoin, they have an impending uh, problem to deal with in that their coin emission is coming up to this 21 million mark. It's going to go basically to zero. Then um, they're... There are some papers out there that have proposed that the security of the network might be in jeopardy at that point. What if we take the first derivative of this curve? So we, we look at how much more supply is there in this year versus last year. In other words, what's the inflation rate? Here's, the, here's what you see. Um, I'm comparing several different assets here. So this is the inflation rate of gold. We usually don't think of gold as inflating, but of course they're miners, they're actual physical miners digging in the ground and you know, coming up with gold chunks to add to the world supply of above ground gold. And so that turns out to be about one and a half percent per year of, of inflation in gold. So if you think of gold as being sound money, then that one and a half percent inflation rate is gonna be sort of a, like, a, like a line in the sand. As you can see, uh, both Bitcoin and Monero, uh, this dotted blue line is showing where we are right now. We're coming to a very interesting point in cryptocurrency history in that up until now, there's been a lot of emission happening, right? In order to get these coins out there, the block rewards have been relatively high. But we're now coming upon a new kind of era of scarcity if you look at this um, to the right of here. And in fact, the inflation rate of Monero is going to be lower than that of Bitcoin for the next uh, six years until 2025. Then there's going to be a four-year period when they're about the same. And then starting in 2029, the, uh, the inflation rate of uh, Bitcoin will once again go below Monero. But then again, this comes at with a question mark. How are those miners going to be paid to be in incentivized to support the network since that is a crucial feature of Nakamoto consensus is that game theoretically all of the miners are incentivized to be honest and not to try to game the system for their own greed. All right, there's a form of unwanted scarcity and that's mining hardware and this is something that has been uh, a big issue in, in Monero. In the Bitcoin white paper Nakamoto wrote one CPU one vote and that idea is that the reward that a miner gets should be proportional to their effort. It should be proportional to the expense that the miner incurred in, in mining. Uh, so, in other words, there should ideally be a linear function between the uh, miner's expense and the miner's reward. Now, unfortunately, e economies of scale in silicon manufacturing have destroyed this linear relationship. So, in other words, if you have about uh, $25 million to spend on a, on a new fabrication facility in Shenzhen, then you can, you can churn out your own silicon chips that do nothing but um, do the Bitcoin proof of work, right? These are ASICs. Um, and so they've been on the network now on Bitcoin for several years now, to the point that at this point, Bitcoin mining is basically a Chinese uh, oligopoly. Um, and so this brings up a uh, centralization concern, right? It's not necessarily a problem that it's China that has all the mining. It's, it's really more of a problem that it's one certain area of the world that has basically control of all of the world's Bitcoin, Bitcoin hash power. There are further um, news items that are cause for concern. For example, the growing trade war between China and the West. Um, there is a press article out that said, you know, the Chinese government has recently decreed that only Chinese computer hardware is to be used in government offices starting in like a year. 
They, there's some deadline by which all of the Dells and the um, American, basically, companies, computers are to be kicked out. So something similar could well happen for um, Chinese manufactured Bitcoin ASICs. We kind of take for granted that there's a free flow of goods in the world, but what happens if uh, not only does one part of the world control the manufacture of all of the crypto hash power, but then is unable to even export it due to a trade war. So in Monero, we tried to take this decentralization question uh, quite seriously. And so we've uh, done some changes to the proof of work to support the little guy who's mining. That is, you know, when Bitcoin started, it was possible for just a regular person running you know, the Bitcoin uh, client on their computer to actually have a shot at getting a mining reward. Those days are long gone because now uh, the, the hash power is dominated by these massive um, farms of ASICs. So it's just hopeless for any little guy to try to mine Bitcoin. Um, in Monero, we're trying to change that. And so the proof of work has been modified several times. And now, uh, as of um, just last month, the proof of work in Monero is now RandomX, which actually uses every single capability of a CPU in doing the proof of work. There's a, basically a random program that gets executed. Uh, each core of the processor needs two gigabytes of RAM to run well. So um, this was a design decision made to, uh, um, to make it harder for botnets to control the network. Because if your computer is infected with a botnet and, you know, 14 out of your 16 gigabytes of RAM are being eaten up, you're probably going to notice it, right? So it was deliberate, that design decision in RandomX to use a high um, required amount of RAM for processing. There's another source of scarcity that is not necessarily one that you want in a blockchain, and that is access to layer one. So Bitcoin's one megablock uh, block limit caused a project fork. There was basically a civil war in Bitcoin over whether or not it was okay to, to make blocks stay at this one megabyte limit, it still rages on to this day. It's still a holy war. And uh, this is something that Monero has avoided thus far. Uh, its solution to this is to use an adaptive block size in which the maximum block size of a Monero block is flexible and it can organically uh, expand or shrink along with demand with, of course, um, provisions in there to uh, prevent the system from getting gamed. And there's ongoing research to reduce the transaction size. Uh, there's bulletproofs that went in recently that reduced transaction sizes by a factor of 10 uh, that went in uh, and overnight the transaction fees for transacting Monero went down by a factor of 10 because the, the transaction fee is based on the kilobyte size of the transaction. This baby is just one second old. Here in the delivery room of Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, he has just won his first fight, the fight to life. Men, his parents allowed our cameras to film his birth. His footprints are taken for identification. He is still less than a minute old, and this is his first record. His file has begun. When this baby is a young man celebrating his 17th birthday, the year will be 1984. Will his 1984 be the world that George Orwell foresaw? A world stripped of privacy? A world watched by Big Brother? Or will this child have what Justice Brandeis at the turn of the century labeled our inalienable right? The right to enjoy life. The right to privacy. Bitcoin is transparent. So if you are new to crypto, you might be under the impression that if you have Bitcoin, you're, you're anonymous. It's this anonymous magic internet money that you might have heard about. Nothing could be further from the truth. The, the popular press continues to push this misleading narrative. Bitcoin is completely transparent. And if you read the Bitcoin white paper, it's all there. It's, it's specified that uh, the sender the receiver and how much got sent is 
recorded in plain text and recorded in the blockchain, which because it has all this proof of work up behind it, remember what I was saying about each transaction in the block has a, a hash that makes it a very rare and unique set of data. Uh, it's, it's the multiple of one million atoms thing, right? So basically these transparent details are written and etched into that blockchain forever. There is no escaping that. It's, it's um, completely incompatible, for example, with European privacy law, the GDPR, which has this right to be forgotten. That is totally non-existent in Bitcoin. Once a transaction gets put into the Bitcoin blockchain, it's there. It's there forever. And um, the only thing that is not um, totally transparent is that the Bitcoin address is just a hex string, right? Or it's a, it's a, it's a string. I mean, when you come down to it, everything's a hex string. But you know, the Bitcoin address is a sequence of letters and numbers that looks anonymous. But once that gets associated to your name and face, that that association, that metadata, that marriage between a Bitcoin account number and your identity, that doesn't change. So because the blockchain is etched in stone forever and it's constantly growing, the job of the people trying to identify and dox everyone is it's just a waiting game. So you have this blockchain, every day you get some little piece of information. Oh, you know, Joe in Leipzig. Uh, you know, um, signed up with uh, uh, Exchange, right? So now their identity information is associated with this. So basically this metadata just kind of continues to gather on this blockchain until you have a situation which is actually much worse than in fiat. When you have a fiat bank account, you do not expect that your bank is going to post your monthly statement up on the bulletin board outside the bank for everybody to see, right? But that is exactly the situation in Bitcoin. And it's not just the people out in your neighborhood who can see it, it's everybody. Everybody in the world can see uh, who sent what to who and when. The unfortunate uh, consequence of this is that Bitcoins have a history behind them, right? So remember that in Bitcoin, every Bitcoin in existence first came into being as a reward that went to a miner. Once the miner gets that Bitcoin and then they spend it, it starts circulating in the Bitcoin economy, right? But because the blockchain is transparent, it's totally see-through, the entire history of every single Bitcoin now in existence can be traced back to this person, that person, this person, all the way back to when it was mined. It's as if you have a, like a 10 euro uh, banknote and on the back of that 10 euro banknote, you see a nice list showing everyone before you who owned that, right? What could possibly be the negative consequences of this? How about innocent people getting falsely accused because they happen to have received money from somebody who unbeknownst to them was involved in something that was not very good, right? This is happening in Bitcoin. It's, uh, there's a reputation in Bitcoin that transfers as well as value. And that is, that is what is profoundly disturbing about having this, and I call it a surveillance coin. In a surveillance coin, it's not just value that transmits, it's also reputation, which means if you're accepting money from somebody, you're also accepting their, like their life, like their life history. It's coming to you too. It's not just value. In contrast, Monero is fungible. Fungible just means that every unit of currency is indistinguishable from the other units, right? So if I have 10 Monero, you have 10 Monero, and then you know, we both trade the 10 Monero to other people, they still look like the 10 Monero. There's no history. It works just like a, like a cash bill. It works just like cash would, you would think cash should work. And it does this by adding three technologies on top of what Bitcoin does that preserve uh, privacy. One is ring signatures. So in ring signatures, the sender of funds is lined up along with 10 other senders of funds, and the only thing that you know happened in that transaction is one out of those 11 people sent money. So it's as if every time you spend money, now you have 10 friends or 10, 10 random people, 10 decoys, and all that you know cryptographically is one of the 11 of you sent the money. So that protects the sender's identity. 
how about the receiver's identity? Well, the receiver's uh, Monero account does not appear unencrypted on the Monero blockchain. So a one-time uh, use address is what gets put on the blockchain. So that protects the recipient's privacy. How about the amount that gets sent? Because there are um, um, attacks that can be done by knowing, like kind of observing your pattern of uh, how much you spend. Um, that is covered with uh, technology Ring CT, which originally was developed for Bitcoin, but actually first got implemented in Monero. Ring CT is, stands for Confidential tra Transactions, and it, all these things combine to make uh, Monero's fungibility. So the end result is that in Monero, coins are indistinguishable from their another, or they have no memory. They have no memory of where they've been, which is really what you want in a money, because the opposite, if you have money that has perfect memory, like it is in Bitcoin, that un unfortunately gets used to falsely associate activities of people who had nothing to do with each other. Because Monero is fungible, users benefit by having privacy. So the Monero blockchain is public. Just like Bitcoin, there is a publicly uh, shared ledger of who sent what to who that everybody in the world can get. All you have to do is download the Monero software and you too can have a copy of this ledger of that has the complete history of who sent what to who. The difference is that in Monero, the details of this uh, blockchain are encrypted. Right? So that if you just look at it, you see encrypted garbage. You cannot do what you can do in Bitcoin, which is type in somebody's Bitcoin address and immediately see how much money they have. Right? I represent uh, high net worth clients, institutional investors, and for them, this kind of feature is a showstopper. Like, no, nobody with wealth wants anyone in the world to type in their bank account and see instantly how much money they have or see instantly whenever they transfer money out or get money in, as you can do in the Bitcoin blockchain. You can set a, you know, a little um, automated robot to like watch the blockchain for you and send you a, an, an alert on your cell phone whenever a transaction goes in and out of any uh, Bitcoin address that you choose, right? This sort of kind of casual surveillance, this, this invitation to be creepy on your neighbor is something that is intrinsically part of, of Bitcoin. And the, the deeper it gets into society, the more insidious it is, the more of a threat it is to all of our privacy. So a slander that happens is that, okay, so you have this money that doesn't have a history, sounds like uh, only the criminals are gonna wanna use it. Um, this is a, it's a slander, I'm kind of tired of hearing it. Monero benefits people who have nothing to hide. So the, the chief benefit is that with a money that has no memory, there's no need to worry about being falsely accused of misdeeds due to being one hop away from a quote unquote bad person. Basically when you um, accept a surveillance coin, you are accepting the risk that somebody unsavory will be sending you something. For example, let's say you have a business, you sell stickers or shirts, t-shirts or something very innocent, right? And you decide that you're gonna accept Bitcoin for your business, right? Unbeknownst to you, you get a t-shirt order from you know, a gangster or you know, some drug dealer or someone like that. Like, you had no idea they were a drug dealer, they're just sending you some Bitcoin because you're, you're a t-shirt seller and this is how you make money, you need to get money from people. But because the people watching the blockchain and putting faces and names on addresses in the blockchain don't know that, so they can try to program that in, but in, at the end, it's a probabilistic assessment of is this bad person really related to you? And so the only, the only way that somebody finds out that they've been bitten by this is that, oh, gee, Coinbase just emailed me and uh, my, my account's been closed, right? or even the fiat bank that I had associated with my crypto exchange now thinks that there's something suspicious about me. Now my fiat bank has like frozen my funds for some reason. And it had nothing to do with anything that the person in question did. It's just that the money itself has this fatal flaw of being um, totally uh, having, having a history behind it. It's not really money. It's like, it's like Beanie Babies, it's like collectibles. It's like collectible items with their own serial number that are getting passed around in this economy. 
It's not a real money. All right, I want to leave with a Nobel Prize winning idea. So I find that not too many people have heard of this paper. George Akerlof uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics for his work on asymmetric information in markets. Um, anyone here know this paper well? Um, okay, all right, great. So I'll explain it briefly. There are two kinds of used cars, right? They're uh, lemons, which are the bad used cars, right? Those are the, the they, you buy them and then they break immediately. Those are lemons. The other kind of used car is a peach. These are the good cars. So those owners of the peaches, they did all the maintenance, they changed the oil, they did all the work to make sure that they have a nice car to sell, right? Sellers know whether they're selling a lemon or a peach, right? The seller knows that. If you're selling a lemon, you know it, and you're just trying to make money off the selling of the lemon. If you have a peach, you know it because you've been doing maintenance on that car. However, the buyer of the car is ignorant, right? Because both lemon sellers and peach sellers make extra sure that the paint job on the car is extra shiny, right? So they, the cars all look alike to the buyer. So the buyer knows that they are vulnerable in this situation. The buyer knows that they could end up with a lemon, right? Because the buyer is ignorant, but not totally ignorant, they are actually aware of their own ignorance because of that, the buyer then adjusts their offer price to be slightly lower than that of a peach. The, the, asking this, the offer price for the car is gonna be not quite at the peach price here, it's gonna be slightly lower, right? What happens then? If you're selling a lemon and you see this pretty high price being offered for cars, you're happy, right? Because your lemon, which is worth this low price, can sell for this. So the lemon sellers are happy. They, they, there are more suckers out there to buy their lemons, right? How about the peach sellers? The peach sellers are the ones who did the work to have a good car to sell, and now they're seeing this offer price, which is less than the peach price. They're discouraged and slightly offended, right? Because the, all that the work that they did, all the good work that they did to keep that car good, and they followed all the rules with their car, that good behavior is not getting rewarded in the form of a high price coming from the buyer, right? So the peach sellers get discouraged and they leave the market. So what happens is that peach sellers leave, well, now the buyers figure out that their chance of buying a lemon has just gone up. And so the price that they're gonna offer goes down. And so you have this race to the bottom in which the offer price keeps going down, down, down. All of the good sellers leave the market because they are not being uh, justly compensated for the work that they've done. What does this have to do with cryptocurrency? Surveillance coins, which have a total record and a total history of who had them, are the used cars of cryptocurrency. So whenever you buy Bitcoin from somebody and you don't know the history of that Bitcoin, you are the used car buyer in this situation. You don't know if you accept this Bitcoin, am I going to be just fine? Or am I going to be falsely accused of, of some, who knows what? Who knows what you know, possible crime could have been done with the person who used to own that Bitcoin now? You don't know if that's going to happen to you. So as a Bitcoin receiver, you are in the seller, uh, in the position of the used car buyer, right? What in this paper is identified as a means to avoid this race to the bottom is a signal. So in the, in the car market, for example, um, there's probably something similar to this in Europe where you can type in the serial number, the VIN number of a car, and then you get a report of all the, you can see if it's been in an accident. It, this doesn't exist in Europe. Okay, well, um, business idea for somebody. Uh, it exists in the United States, it's called Carfax and you type in the serial number of a car and all of its kind of past history comes up. That information can equalize the playing field between the buyers and the sellers of cars, right? This also happens in the job market. So education is a similar situation. So if you are a boss, you're hiring a worker, you have 100 workers out there applying for jobs, they all look the same to you because it's like everyone starts looking the same, after, like all the resumes look the same after a while, right? So how are, you, how are the um, sellers of their labor going to distinguish themselves? They're gonna have a signal. 
So education is a signal just like information in the car, uh, used car market is, right? So basically, the sellers of labor take it upon themselves to get uh, educational, educational credential to signal to the buyer of labor that their labor is going to be worth more, right? Unfortunately, what happens is that the sellers of education then figure this out and then they just start selling education because they know that the people coming for the education are just going to, to get a, like an employment signal. And so the actual purpose of the education gets lost. So this is happening in non-fungible cryptocurrencies as well. So right now, anybody who signs up for an account at a centralized exchange has to do all sorts of kind of de degrading things. You have to hold up a picture of your ID. You have to make a little handwritten note that says, this is, this is my name. You, know, you have to basically submit all this stuff just to be deemed worthy enough to participate in this cryptocurrency economy. Right? So that is a signal in this sense too. But what's interesting is that in cryptocurrency, currently the, the exchanges bear the burden of due diligence on their customers. Right? So it's an expense for the exchanges to be doing to check all these people out. It could be that in the future, that just like in the education market and in the car market, it's the seller who's, the, who's gonna have to increasingly go through hoops basically to prove their worthiness in this whole system. All right, so just to take, take a step back, um, I've gone over scarcity in Bitcoin and Monero and I've gone over fungibility and privacy in Bitcoin and Monero. And if we step back, I can identify what I think is a reason why crypto is not gonna go away why it's here to stay. Now we have the internet, we have um, mobile telecommunication. Everybody here has uh, at least one device that is extremely good at copying packets, right? That's what cell phones are. They're just packet copiers. You're, when you fetch your email, you are copying packets from the email server to your phone to check, right? We've become just I extraordinarily efficient at copying ones and zeros globally. The, the marginal cost of shuttling these bits around is zero. So what is rare in that world? What is rare in a world where every human on earth, basically, has the ability to copy ones and zeros anywhere around the world for free? Well, it's going to be digital scarcity and digital privacy. Digital scarcity in the sense that there's a sequence of ones and zeros that only you know which is cryptocurrency, that's the private key. And privacy, in which you have a sequence of ones and zeros also that you only know, and that you haven't shared with everyone. Like you've shared the contents of your lunch on Facebook with the entire world, you know, and, and other you know, details of your life that are basically copied around. These are the two things that are gonna be scarce in the future. Digital scarcity di and digital privacy. Cryptocurrencies offer both. And cryptocurrencies like Monero especially offer both because they offer privacy as well. So the values of the money we use every day are the values fixed by the government. The paper bills and even the coins are not in themselves actually worth the amounts they represent. Their face values, however, are guaranteed not only by huge reserves of gold and silver, but by the stability of the government, which fixed those values. As long as people remain confident that our government is strong and secure, they will continue freely to accept and spend its money without questioning the value. So in the past, when we've had fiat money, basically your nationality depended, like your nationality told you what community you belong to for purposes of money. If you're born in the Eurozone, well, you use Euros. Like, I was born American, so I use the US dollar. Like, that kind of gets told to you at birth as an accident of where you were born. Now, with cryptocurrencies, because the, the system of bookkeep, bookkeeping is a decentralized network of computers that can be worldwide, this idea of association is now fluid. It's more open. It's, it's really like the, um, the Reformation of the church like the, um, to another famous you know, German, Martin Luther, like who, who liberated um, theology from the uh, kind of centralized control of the Catholic Church and kind of liberated this um, ability for people to 
you know, elect to worship in the way that they chose, right? A similar sort of thing is now possible because of Nakamoto consensus, uh, now almost, you know, 11 years and a month old. Now it's possible for each one of us to kind of pick a group, pick your own church, pick, pick your own, like, that's not really quite right, but I think you get what I'm saying. You can pick your own group of people who agree on certain characteristics that they want their money to have, and you are free to associate with each of those groups. So Bitcoin is one such group. That's one such group that apparently doesn't, you know, really is not too bothered by the fact that the currency has this perfect knowledge of history for every single coin that's out there. And that is a large association of people, all of whom um, have the shared belief that the token that they are keeping track of on their blockchain is money, right? And so there's a similar um, sort of community sort of um, formation that happens with the cryptocurrencies. Um, so I'd like to share some of my observations about the Monero community. And, and by the way, I'm, uh, I'm volunteering to be here. Uh, I've paid my own dime to come out here from Boston uh, to kind of share what I've, uh, I think, um, my understanding of the current status of cryptocurrency with you. Uh, Monero is, it basically, it's run like a charity. There is no company behind it. There's no pre-mine. There's no scammy like way for people to get rich. Um, all of the Monero in existence were given in the past to a miner who was doing the accounting work to help support the network, just like in Bitcoin. So both Bitcoin and Monero have the positive aspect that there's no central you know, company steering things to kind of make a profit. No, it's, it's totally open source, grassroots, just you know, normal, everyday people choosing to run some... Um, peer-to-peer -peer network software on their computer and join this community who have this shared like ethos in what they think that money should be. Uh, so the Monero community, I find it to be the, um, idealistic, scientific, and yet very welcoming. It's very chill. Um, like there's, there's like a lot of alpha geek happening in some other coins in which people are just really out there on Twitter just, and they just really want everyone to know that they're the alphaist geek out there, you know. That, that kind of thing is refreshingly absent in Monero. It's very chill. It's one thing that kind of I like about this whole vibe here at C3 that like, it's very chill. There's just like a lot of people lounging. And that, that sort of shared, relaxed atmosphere is something that I've personally observed at the Monero meetups that I've been to. Um, Monero Research Lab, we have full-time PhDs. Uh, who do nothing but cryptographic research. Um, there's sort of a pipeline of research in which um, pure science gets done at Monero Research Lab, then implementations of the promising idea get tested out, then there's an audit process that we, we actually um, employ uh, uh, external auditors to look at implementations of code. Once those are um, you know, clean, then uh, we go to release. So there's this basically pipeline of technology from science to engineering that gets pushed out in the actual uh, release of the Monero uh, so, um, core software. The LMDB da database is another um, kind of interesting example of how far Monero has come. In the early days of Monero, the entire blockchain was stored in RAM, if you can believe that. So um, that kind of puts a hard limit on how big your blockchain can be if it has to fit in RAM. The LMDB blockchain uh, database, which was um, the brainchild of Howard Chu, who is uh, one of the very frequent com um, contributors and sort of an uh, open source uh, Linux guru, uh, was added to Monero. Monero is actually number three in terms of developer effort. If you look at the, if you rank the coins not by market cap, but by actual developer effort, it goes Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then Monero. Um, it turns out that, it, well, in my opinion, the killer app of Nakamoto consensus is money because um, you're, you have a ledger of scarcity that's being shared and what, what more natural thing is there for a uh, shared uh, idea of scarcity than money. But it turns out that money is non-trivial to get right. You, it needs to be thought through. Like these, these things like should the money be have a complete history behind it or should it be um, fungible? 
Like that kind of basic idea, that basic engineering design decision has to be made early on because the technology that's needed to bake in fungibility to Monero, it's highly non-trivial. Like Monero has been added for six years now and has made great improvements in that. And uh, the way that the social contract is, I, I just can't see this happening in, in, in Bitcoin. Um, they're volunteer work groups for community outreach. Um, and as I said before, all of the funding to support all of this is completely 100% shaking the tin cup and asking for people to donate out of the kindness of their hearts. And the people in the Monero community do that. They actually step up to the plate and they um, fulfill these. But if you look at the, like, the annual budget, if, if Monero were a company, which it is not, but if Monero were a company and you looked at its operating budget, you would be astounded at how, how minuscule, how tiny it is. And that's because you have idealistic, passionate people working on this project uh, in true open source uh, spirit, like often on their spare time. All right. So um, just to summarize, Monero is what Bitcoin noobs think they bought. So I'm going to switch hats a little bit. So um, as I mentioned, one of, the, one of my jobs before going full-time into crypto, I was head of research at a hedge fund. And so the question of like, thinking of cryptocurrency as an investment comes up. And of course, because there have been these spectacular gains in the price of Bitcoin, um, it, it gets uh, discussed a lot. One thing that is positive about Monero's culture is that it is generally gauche to talk about prices and returns and the price going to the moon. Um, I hope that, uh, well, so I have some background in academic finance. I, um, there's a paper that I co-authored on the effect of liquidity on asset prices that won a paper of the year award in um, applied finance. So, and that coupled with like the Nobel Prize that I just explained, hopefully I can put a respectable enough academic sheen on the discussion of of the finance and economics to, um, to be forgivable by the Monero community. Um, but the fact is that this project is going to attract investors. It's going to attract hodlers. It's a socioeconomic hedge. So there are lots of investment, there are lots of ETFs out there. If you believe that uh, companies should be environmentally uh, sustainable and that their corporate boards should have official policies that you know, mandate uh, um, sustainability in one sense or another, there are ETFs that will only invest in those companies, right? So it's possible to be a, basically an ideological investor. So if you really care about sustainability and you, and then, then there's an investment for you, right? If, for example, like a, say Islamic finance, they are not cool with the idea of interest being paid on loans. So you have another subset of Islamic finance, uh, investments that don't involve paying interest on loans. Monero, if you look at it in a similar lens, is basically the, a, an ideal hedge for people who have two characteristics. One is that they're concerned about mismanagement and corruption on the part of central banks managing fiat. And two, they're gravely disturbed by the state of surveillance capitalism in which everything about all of us is recorded all the time and will stay forever. And we have little or no control over that. Um, it's done in the name of security, but unfortunately, if you push that line too far, you cease to become an open and free society. Uh, there, there are reasons that we, in the West have put limits on the powers of government. And that is because of an awareness of what happens when there are no limits on the powers of government. So a project like Monero is a hedge for, it's basically a, a put your money where your mouth is kind of thing for people who have strong uh, feelings on those two points. So it's just gonna attract investors. Um, Gresham's law is an economic uh, concept that the best form of money gets hoarded. So people keep the best kind of money, and the inferior form of money, they're going to use that to spend, right? But the good stuff, they're going to keep for themselves. That's Gresham's law. So with Monero, this tends to happen. Like a lot of people in Monero used to be in Bitcoin, but now whenever they um, deal with Bitcoin, they find their heads 
consumed with all these worries about like you know traceability, um, you know, you know, uh, and so on. So it's refreshing to come to Monero where you don't have to worry about that because the currency is actually fungible. And because it's fungible, it becomes a superior form of money that gets hoarded by Gresham's law. That's another tendency that's going to happen to, for people to want to keep the Monero and spend the other stuff. Um, also, capital gains taxes, uh, at least in America, and I believe in Germany too, if you, if you hold an asset for over a year in Germany, you don't have to pay gains on it. Is that, that's what I've read, is that right, in Germany? So basically, the, the tax law promotes looking at those cryptocurrency projects that are solid and have a real reason to exist. And so that is also going to attract investment money to Monero. The question is, can these new investors integrate into the community? And so um, part of what I do as a consultant is I try to bridge these worlds. I try to take these new investors whose um, inclination might be to want to talk to the manager of Monero and have a word with them about the uh, release schedule and they want this and this and this feature built into the next, you know, like basically this whole mentality of I own, you know, some tokens, therefore I'm your customer and you have to do what I say, uh, which of course falls completely flat on its face in any open source project. You know, that's, that's not how changes get, happen in Linux. Like nobody goes to Linus and like demands, make, makes ultimatums on what they want to see in the next rollout. So like basically I'm, I, one thing that I'm doing is trying to bridge these worlds of the in, traditional investment world and that of the OG cryptocurrency open source world that's surrounding us here. So community investors, I, I posit, are kind of a subset of investors that uh, can be valued members of the community. Instead of being entitled and thinking that they're customers, they'll take the attitude that they're helping to bear financial risk on behalf of the project. Uh, they will do things like take self-custody of their coins. Be, and not just leave them on exchange, which lots of people do. Lots of people leave their crypto on exchanges, then the exchange gets hacked, they lose their money. The reality is if the money is on the exchange, you don't own the private key, then it's not your crypto. It's actually an IOU that you own for crypto. It's not crypto that you own. Um, and there's a another, you know, kind of a list of aspects that I um, think are proper for uh, like a community type of investor to be a solid member of the Monero community. Um, one thing to do also is to make sure that there are proper legal structures around one's ownership of cryptocurrency. And so one, one of the subsets of the traditional finance world that I help to bridge with cryptocurrency is that of trusts. Um, in, in a um, statutory law uh, kind of regime like Germany, the, the whole concept of trust might be a little foreign because it comes from English common law. But the idea is that a trust is a legal entity. It's a legal thing. It's kind of like a company, but it, it's a different category of, of legal structure. A trust is a uh, kind of like a holding vessel for funds that a giver wants to give to beneficiaries, but not immediately. Right? So basically, there are three people involved. There's a grantor who has wealth and wants to transfer it to the beneficiaries, but not just outright. They want the money to go into a trust. So the grantor will work to make the rules of the trust and then transfer property into the trust. As part of the document that defines the trust, you have a list of beneficiaries who could ultimately benefit from the property. And then you have a third party, which is the trustee. The trustee is the legal owner of the assets that are given into trust, but the legal owner is with conditions. The legal owner cannot do whatever they want with the property. They have to follow the instructions that are in the trust document. Right? So in effect, this is what crypto people would think of as a smart contract. It's kind of the original old school legal contract. And if you're um, kind of um, careful with which jurisdictions you place the various players in the trust, there are advantages that can be had. Um, which are very dependent on jurisdiction. Uh, and it's just completely impossible for me to kind of spell it out because of the complexity of this. But possible benefits are legal tax reduction, um, protection from being sued, in other words. So if, if money is in a trust, it's not the giver's money anymore. 
it's not the wealth owner's money anymore, it's the trust money. So if somebody sues the wealth owner, the, the wealth is gone. It's not theirs anymore. It belongs to the trust. And then there are trust laws that protect that money from lawsuits as well, right? So most people think, well, you know, who, I'm at low risk, like I'm, I'm a nice guy, I don't like hurt anybody, nobody's gonna sue me. But one glaring exception to this is divorce. So people routinely get robbed by um, people who they only recently uh, married. And, um, and it turns out that irrevocable trusts made before marriage, you have to do it before, or otherwise it won't count, but it's one of the only things that can survive uh, like a challenge, right? Um, and also legal enhanced privacy. So depending on the jurisdiction in which you place the trust, you could benefit from enhanced privacy uh, protecting those assets. So actually relevant to people who are not Americans, uh, you may or may not be aware of this, but um, there's kind of a saying within uh, estate planning and wealth management that America is the new Switzerland. Uh, and this is because America has laws that are asymmetric. America has a law called FATCA, which was put in by Obama, which requires worldwide financial institutions to send data on Americans back to the IRS. This is why it's almost impossible for an American to get a German bank account, because the German bank account will have a whole bunch of burdensome reporting requirements to the IRS to take on this American customer, right? So that's why Americans have a lot of trouble when they go overseas to work. So in reaction to this, the other countries of the world came up with what's called CRS, which is the common reporting standard. So the idea is the same. Like the germ, you know, for example, you know, one, one European government wants to make sure that uh, its citizens are not trying to hide money in Australia, right? So they, they, dis they sign this like agreement for all these countries to share financial information with each other to make sure that nobody's cheating on their taxes, right? So there's basically a bunch of countries that have signed on to this CRS, but America is not one of them. So thus lies the asymmetry that um, for U.S. citizens who are doing affairs abroad, like legitimate businesses abroad, all of that information gets sent back to the IRS. But for a non-U.S. person who sets up financial affairs in the U.S., there is no obligation for the U.S. to send the information back to the home country. So that's the saying, um, America's the new Switzerland. Two small dippers vibrate on the surface of the water. Each dipper produces its own pulse, and the two sets of patterns overlap. Now the dippers are put out of step. They're vibrating in antiphase and produce a different pattern. In step, they produce a pattern like this. Out of step, the pattern is like this. All right, this is kind of a complicated one, but this is showing the degree to which the monthly ups and downs of Monero versus the monthly ups and downs of Bitcoin versus the monthly ups and downs of the US stock market, the US bond market, and gold, right? So each, so for example, this, this um, square here is showing the intersection of Monero and Bitcoin, right? On this axis, you see uh, the Monero return. On this axis, you see the Bitcoin return. So you can see that um, on months when Monero does well, Bitcoin also tends to do well. So you have this kind of pattern, this correlation here that you can see. You, you can also see that there's some really extreme outlier months for Monero in the positive. There's, this particular month, uh, Monero basically quadrupled in one month. Uh, so there, this is part of owning crypto is that you're on this really wild roller coaster wide um, and you need to kind of be able to deal with that. So, but what this is showing is that there, there is a correlation between the returns of Monero and Bitcoin. That's a 0.4 correlation. A 1.00 correlation is perfectly correlated. They go up and down together. Negative one is the opposite. If one goes up, the other goes down. So in modern portfolio theory, 
and this is true for also your own personal portfolio. It's an idea to think about. If you have two assets who's, who you expect to do well in the future, and they're uncorrelated, in other words, when one asset goes up, the other is flat, or maybe the other one goes down. In other words, the ups and downs from day to day of these two different assets tend to cancel each other out. If you have that situation, then if you make a portfolio out of both of those assets, your combined volatility is going to be improved. It's going to be reduced because the, the components that you're adding are anti-correlated, right? So this is, this is a very big deal for Wall Street investors because it turns out correlation structure tends to be more dependable and long-lived than um, uh, predictions of outperformance. So correlation structures tend to persist. So Wall Street's always looking for sources of uncorrelated uh, alpha. So for example, if you look at the correlation of Monero with traditional assets like US stocks, we have 0.01. So it's an idea to think about, is that um, putting together assets that wiggle in different ways can be a positive force for your overall portfolio. Now again, as I mentioned, this is only talking about correlation structure. This is like the ups and downs. This is not talking about is the price going to go up in the future. That's a different question. So let me show this, uh, and then I'll finish. I'm sorry I'm going over. Uh, but um, I guess there's no one after me. But I'll try to make it quick. So I think what I'm showing here is pretty much the only asset price chart you need and that is a very long-term view. So this is showing from the beginning of cryptocurrency, 2009 to 2020. This is 11 years of history. And you almost never see this in the, like the crypto bloggers or people on YouTube blabbing about crypto. They're always focused on what happened yesterday. Like that, it's, it's totally a distraction for anyone who has a long-term view. So I would suggest whenever looking at crypto as an asset to zoom out on the horizontal scale and also zoom out on the vertical scale. So what I'm showing here, each of these divisions is a factor of 10, right? So here we have one cent, one dollar, and $10,000. So this is you know, an in, in, initial investment of one euro becoming 10 million euros. That's the scale, right? And so on this sort of scale, all of these ups and downs, which seem big, disappear. So for example, let's look at the S&P 500, the US stock market. So if, you, if you're involved at all in the stock market, you know that December 2019 has been a very good month, right? We're talking 15% you know, up, which is really big for the stock market. But if you look on this, on this scale, it's like a pixel, right? So. I think this underlines the decision that anyone has when thinking about cryptocurrency as a possible investment. It's this kind of baby. It's still a baby. It's, it's amazing because it's gone up like uh, orders of magnitude, and yet compared to other assets, it's still a baby. This next chart shows that. So what I've done here is that it's hard to understand if somebody tells you that the price of Bitcoin is $7,000, it's hard to know whether that's high or low, right? Like, who knows? Like, it, it's all kind of, um, it, it, it's just really hard to know because it's just one Bitcoin and it's hard to put that in perspective. So what I've done here is I've taken the value of all of the Bitcoin in existence, right? So starting from the beginning of Bitcoin, as time goes on, more Bitcoins got rewarded to miners, so there have been more Bitcoins in existence, and the price has been going up and down, right? So I multiply the number of Bitcoins in existence by the current price, and that gives you the market cap. What I've done with that is I've divided that by the value of all of the gold above ground in the world, right? So all of the gold that has been already been dug out of the ground and is sitting in vaults around the world and owned mostly by central governments, but also a good amount is in jewelry and so on, and there are estimates of this. So basically there are estimates for how much gold there is in the world at any given time. So I've divided the value of all the world's Bitcoin divided by the value of all the world's gold, and I've done that for uh, 11 years. 
So what you can see here is that currently the value of all the Bitcoin in the world is about 1% that of all the gold. In other words, all the gold is worth 100 times what all the Bitcoin is worth. And if you do that for Monero, and arguably this analogy is even more apt for Monero because when you turn a, block, a bar of gold over, you don't see a list of everyone who owned that bar of gold. You just see gold. So Monero acts more like actual gold than Bitcoin does. Therefore, it makes more sense to make a ratio of all the world's Monero, how much is that worth, divide that by how much all the world's gold is worth. If you do that, we're looking at one one hundredth of one percent. So that's what I mean when I say that this asset class is still a baby. It's still early. Uh, things could go well for it. Things could go very wrong for it. There could be a bug that nobody knows about. There could be governmental action, which a lot of people, I think, overly worry about because they, um, I think we geeks tend to think of governments as being like Reddit moderators with just like ban power. And that's not really how governments work. It's, it's a bit more deliberative. And um, like if an unjust ban happens, there are things like the Supreme Court that uh, might be asked to decide whether, for example, Americans have a fundamental right to transact value in a private manner. Um, this, this could be a, you know, a court that, case that comes up in the future for um, put forth by people who really care about privacy as a fundamental human right. But, so I'll leave with that, and thanks for your attention.